welcome back to Harbour Unboxed. January 2023. We are definitely going to say 2022 somewhere in this Q&A series. For sure, for uh, Guaranteed. Sure. But anyway, new year, new Q&A series. So excited to get into it. Of course, we've asked you guys for some questions. You guys have given us plenty, so we've picked out some goodies. And we'll get into it and answer them. But before we do, today's sponsor spot is brought to you by ASUS and their new ROG Maximus Z790 Hero motherboard, supporting Intel's latest 13th generation processors and DDR5 memory. This premium motherboard also supports next-gen connectivity for graphics, storage, peripherals, and networking, along with high-definition audio. Also included are massive heat sinks covering all of the critical VRM components to ensure maximum overclocking headroom while avoiding throttling. And for novice overclockers, the AI overclocking function has you covered, allowing you to achieve maximum system performance with ease. For our Australian viewers, the ROG Maximus Z790 Hero can be found at various retailers, including PC Case Gear, Scorp Tech, and M-Wave. ASUS also offers a club rewards program, which allows you to receive exclusive prizes after signing up when purchasing any of their products. So for more information, click the link in the video description. First question, very first question, which I'm going to say this, we put at the start of the video. Has to be now. <laughs> um, has this to is, be this now. This will be so awkward at the end of part three. Yep. Yeah. Uh, what do you think of ARC now, months after launch? Better? Worse, could be better. Do you think having them in the market will finally help even the playing fields, especially in the mid-range section of the market? Okay. So yes, we haven't really talked about Intel GPUs and sort of a... No, I much. mean, there's probably a few reasons for that. I wouldn't say any of them are terribly negative. Obviously, we did the initial review and covered it. Yeah. And then there's just been an onslaught of new products and updates and releases and things happening since then. We're still not quite through all of them, but I do plan in about let's say four to six weeks of doing sort of an updated, maybe an RTX 3060, uh, A770 and RX 6650 XT type of yep. shootout, you know, large yep. volume of games. Uh, but I suppose was the first part of that question, do we think things have gotten better or worse? Yeah. And I think un without a doubt, they've got, they've improved for sure. Yep. Uh, I haven't delve into this too deeply, but there's been consistent driver updates improvements direct x9 in particular that's been improved i haven't again done a lot of testing myself i've looked at it briefly but i've seen others who have done a bit of testing and yeah it's definitely been improved so intel seemed pretty committed to improving the situation and not giving up on it uh, at least for this current generation so that's good to see definitely warrants uh, an updated test as i said i would have normally done that already but we've been flat out um as for how I suppose one of the other reasons we haven't really jumped back to it too quickly is because interest initially wasn't super high in any of our ARC, ARC content. Like, it's not something that most of you are seriously considering just yet, which is fair enough. You know, first yep. foray into discrete, well, first real foray into discrete GPUs, their first real crack at it. You know, you're somewhat of a guinea pig there. You don't know how committed they are and how much improvement they will make over time. And the pricing's not amazing because the performance wasn't probably quite where they were hoping it would be like an a770 that's really at best an rtx 3060 slash 6650 xt competitor and given the pricing of especially the radeon gpu that's like 280 dollars i think the cheapest one on new egg thereabouts yeah and you're looking yep. at what like 320 ish dollars for an a770 so a bit of a price premium there and you could argue, you know, better ray tracing performance or whatever. I don't know how much stock you can really place in ray tracing performance <laughs> at that performance tier. Some people will swear by it and say it's a big deal, but I think most of you would agree that it's not really a key selling point at that performance tier. Rasterization performance is kind of king there. Yeah. So, yeah, the Radeon GPU is still a better buy, and it's a more proven product. Yeah. So there's there's a lot more I downsides to an Intel GPU than there is an AMG GPU at this present time. At least you can buy them now. Like there was yes. a period for many months after you had covered them on the channel where you really just could not find them anywhere. Yeah. Short of an updated perform, I, I think uh, based on my day one content, the 6650 XT was about 17% faster on average than the A770. So yeah, and it's cheaper at the moment as well. Yeah, but so, so for general rasterization performance, you're looking at fifteen to twenty percent more performance out of the Radeon GPU. So let's say with the improved drivers and everything, we're just spitballing here. Let's say that Intel has pulled out an on average ten percent performance gain, which yeah. you know there was some really bad titles in there, which could help them get pretty close to that. A ten percent performance gain, they're still on average going to be a little bit slower than the Radeon GPU while costing more. So. 
it's not something where you're going to be like a seven seventy new value king, you know, must buy. Type. They're all yeah. they're a fair way off that happening. Uh, maybe relative to the something like the RTX thirty sixty, which I don't even remember RTX thirty sixty pricing at the it's moment. Ter- it's been terrible value yeah, since launch. That's- There's really been at no point has it been a great buy, no. really, um, which is kind of odd at least because it just seems like the Radeon GPUs have just been destroying that performance segment for the better part of a year Mm. in terms of pricing. Mm -hmm. But then you look at sales data and the 3060 still sells quite well. So it's kind of, you know, if it's still selling, then they don't need to drop the price. Um, But yeah, the the Arc GPU still does need to be a bit cheaper. But I I think I've been impressed with the pace of improvements. Mm, I've been impressed. Intel has, because it'd be very easy for them to to look at the sales figures, which are probably not amazing, and go, Mm -hmm. well, not that many people have bought this. So, you know, let's put all that driver development on the back burner. But they do seem quite committed to looking at the feedback from the community, seeing where the pain points are and sort of improving those over time, which... Mm -hmm really they need to do but i think all of this is just really the groundwork for the next generation like i think they're probably not going to see big sales Mm -hmm. of these arc products Mm -hmm. but they need to make the drivers work now so that when the next gen comes around you know it launches in a much better state and people are going to be more inclined to buy it so you know it's it's a multi-generation sort of thing i don't think many people are expecting intel to just knock it out of the park with the first generation yeah it's going to be very difficult yeah it's never going to happen so, yeah, did we answer all of that question? I think so. Cool. Right, we'll move on to the next one. What proportion of users do you think actually make use of the four DIMM slots on consumer boards? Do you think ATX motherboards with only two DIMMs would be hard to sell? Um, I don't really know what percentage upgrade, but it is very nice to have that ability to add in two more modules if you want to uh, improve capacity. Of course, it can get a little complicated with timings and ranks and all stuff like that where it may limit the performance of the memory um so it's not as easy as just chucking another kit unless it's the exact same kit and i know sometimes there can even be issues there but generally speaking it does work quite well i've not really had many problems but you have to be mindful that ideally you want the same memory or at least memory that's capable of achieving the timings that your existing memory uh timings and frequencies their existing memory can handle um but yeah it's just nice it's good. I think people would want the option. So I imagine yep. most people would just be using the two slots. Mm-hmm. But then people, you'd, you'd if you had two boards and one of them had four and one of them had two dim slots, you would get, and they're otherwise the same, you'd get the one with four even if you're not using them yep. because it just gives you that upgrade opportunity. It's why people want more, you know, more PCI slots, M.2s, USB ports. It just gives you the options. Yeah, so generally speaking, four is certainly better for the general consumer. However, if you're an extreme overclocker or just, you know, an overclocker in general and you want to max out your memory frequencies and that sort of stuff, then two slots is typically going to be, typically going to be better for that. Yep. But I don't think that's most of you guys. So yep. I think having the flexibility there to go from 16 gigs to 32 gigs or 32 to 64 or whatever it may be, I think that's just nice. And realistically, the performance drawbacks, they're not yeah. that huge. Yep. So. Okay, the next question says, I've heard some outlets, uh, like Digital Foundry, really buy into the argument that hardware companies are making up uh, about prices going up, uh, due largely to inflation, diminished price slash performance gains from smaller process nodes, and other increased costs. Uh, What's your take on how much price increases, um, particularly in GPUs, are really being driven by costs as opposed to profit uh, taking? So... Basically, the increased price in GPUs, is it, is it justified? It, it, are, are, there, are there factors that are driving up prices as significantly as we're seeing? Or are they getting a bit greedy? Or is it a bit of both? Um, yeah, I mean... <laughs> Obviously, there's inflation. But yes. is there inflation that sees like a 40 series class or... or, or or what should be like a 4060 Ti become a 4070 Ti at, you know, that price or... Or like double the price? Yeah. I mean, obviously not. I yeah. mean, inflation is not contributing that much. I wouldn't have thought so. It's, at least it's not contributing in a way that would explain the price increases. Mm-hmm. It would be maybe a small component, uh, but not not the whole picture. Mm-hmm. As for like the using the smaller nodes being a significant increase to the cost of the, the dies and so on, 
I mean, that's going to be a part of a factor, but that's also countered somewhat by, at least from NVIDIA's side of things, using smaller dies for the equivalent tier and pricing than what we saw mm -hmm. in the previous generation. The 4070 Ti is using a much smaller GPU die than the $800 GPU from the previous generation, which was like 3080 type sort of pricing. So we're sort of going from these maybe cheaper but larger dies to a more expensive but smaller die. So I would expect that to sort of balance out Price to some should degree. Price somewhat, yeah, offset there. Um, you know, the, the rest of the components on the card, I would imagine, have a f fairly similar cost because we're seeing similar usage of memory, um, similar power requirements outside of the super high-end products, of course. You know, coolers don't look to be significantly altered compared to the previous generation. So all those factors, it doesn't really look like there's a significant hardware component that's sort of obviously taking a $500 GPU and making it $800. Like that's mm. a that's a massive increase in price. And the GPU dies themselves are only a fraction of that cost. Like the actual cost of the die can often be in the sort of 100 to $150 range. Mm -hmm. Like it's not that much silicon. Mm -hmm. um, and certainly, you know, RDNA 3 has this multi die approach as well, which is supposedly able to reduce costs, but then their flagship GPU is priced at exactly the same level as yeah, the previous right. generation. Mm -hmm. So yeah, when you look at sort of the financial reports of these companies, the margins on GPU products are very high. They're not going broke. No, they're, they're certainly targeting like 50 to 60% margins on a lot mm -hmm. of their, their sort of graphics products, which mm -hmm. is very high. Mm -hmm. Like that's a huge chunk of profit per GPU. And then obviously AIBs are also taking a chunk of a, a, a small, small chunk. Small chunk. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, the over the years, you know, we've seen 4070 TIs costing like this thousand dollar models. Mm -hmm. It's an eight hundred dollar GPU MSRP. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I, I don't agree that it's like, like the cost increase is explainable by things like inflation and the, the change in GPU nodes. No. It, it seems mostly like they're pricing it to to the market, except that market isn't actually doesn't actually exist at the moment. Yeah. So yeah, the AMD and Nvidia price inflation is larger than inflation. Yeah, and if we, if inflation for things like GPU dies was a significant factor, then we'd see issues for things like AMD Zen 4 products, mm -hmm. which went from TSMC 7 to 5 nanometer and are priced basically the same. And mm -hmm. if anything, aren't the, G, aren't the triplet dies slightly larger? The IO dies now using 7 nanometer. Mm -hmm. So... And they cost the same. So it's like, yeah, yeah. theoretically, if that was a factor, that would also be impacting CPUs, but mm -hmm. it hasn't. So... Yeah, I, I just, I'm not buying it. No. I'm not buying it. No. All right, Tim, a long question here for you, <laughs> so prepare yourself. Are you guys worried at all about the future of Intel in the market? That's the question. I mean, not really. Are you worried about Intel? I mean, they're not in as dominant of a position as they once were, especially in things like servers. They seem to be getting pretty beaten. Not that I'm well up to date with the goings on of the server market, mm -hmm. but it does seem like AMD has a pretty strong advantage there at the moment. But, you know, if we're talking about the consumer stuff we cover, Intel is still competitive in Very. terms of both performance and price for CPUs. For GPUs, you know, it's not really something to be worried about because it was only, it's only at the very start of the, the journey there. Yeah, so it was, it's like if that works or doesn't, it makes really no difference. Yep. So, no, I'm, I'm not that worried. It sounds like they're getting back on track more in terms of their process nodes, which was holding them back, but that's yeah, less I, of a concern. Prior to like LGA 1200, I was much more concerned about where things were heading. Uh, yeah, for sure. It was looking pretty dicey for a while there where we were just getting Skylake for about five years in a row. Mm -hmm. um, they've, they've shown that they can make quite compelling architectures. Certainly the sort of big core, little core thing, you know, it doesn't, it's not worlds, it's not like a world beater for desktop, especially gaming use, but their peak or architecture is very performant. It's, it works mm -hmm. really well, it mm -hmm. runs well. Um, so no, I don't think I'm super concerned. So if AMD was like 30% faster across the board in, in terms of a lot of categories that maybe I'd be worried, but when they're competitive, it's... Yeah. yeah. Also, I mean, AMD sub... <laughs> AMD survived the bulldozer era, so if that's yeah. possible, Intel can survive just about anything. Yeah, and Intel's got like 
so many resources up its sleeve from their dominant era still, mm -hmm. and they they've got their fingers in many different pies. So yeah, you know, it's yeah, yeah not fine. concerned. All right, Tim, I'm seeing some G-Sync, V-Sync buzzwords here, so I'm going to address this one straight to you. Uh, have you experimented using G-Sync, V-Sync, and frame rate caps to improve picture quality while gaming? These, te these techniques are recommended by Blurbusters, and the idea of sacrificing some frames and input lag to have less stutters, motion blur, and screen tearing seems interesting. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of multiple ways to answer this question, I think. I think... These days, if you're sort of interested in the you know non-tearing experience of so running VSync off above the refresh rate of your monitor, the general recommendation for the best experience is to cap the frame rate slightly under the maximum refresh rate of your monitor. Mm -hmm. That gives you the lowest input latency because as soon as you hit VSync, you're hitting the maximum refresh rate. If you have VSync on, the input latency jumps up significantly. So if you're sort of interested in that sort of optimal, you, you're not really wanting tearing, but you want the highest performance possible, that's typically what's recommended. And that's certainly something that I would recommend. I am some, personally, I'm someone who doesn't enjoy tearing. I find it noticeable. <laughs> you're, not a, you're not a tearing enthusiast? But some multiplayer gamers, right, they just tolerate it. It doesn't bother me too much. Yeah, yeah. so yeah. it's one of those things you have to toss up and may depend on things like your monitor's refresh rate. If you have a 240 hertz monitor, I think doing frame caps makes a lot more sense because you have a very wide range mm. of refresh rates to take advantage of. So you cap the refresh, you cap your in-game FPS like 235 it's going to be a really good experience. But if you're on a 144 hertz monitor and you're playing competitive games and you want to run it like 200, 300 FPS for latency reasons, then, you know, there's still a reason to do that. You're going to have to put up with tearing, but input latency is going to be superior. So yeah, it's just something you have to weigh up depending on, on the games that you want to play. I, I would certainly say for most people who have variable refresh rate monitors, that using variable refresh rates is the way to go making sure you're within that refresh rate window, which for most monitors is going to be very wide. Um, and yeah, just personally, you know, using VSync on with variable refresh rates works well. It doesn't really impact your latency too much. And then yeah, frame caps if you're approaching the top end of the re refresh rate range. So yeah, I don't want to sit here and say everyone should be doing this because I, I, I imagine you you have a- Yeah, one... well, mine's, one, mine's 165, but I yeah. have it at 120 for streaming, yeah. twice the stream frame rate. And I run at three to four hundred FPS, yeah. which is not. I'm not saying that's necessary. It's just I just do. But it's I, a, yeah, it I don't, don't want to. I don't want to cap it at one uh, one nineteen or whatever. Yeah, because so. one one twenty is what eight eight point three seconds of frame. If you're running at three hundred FPS, it's like well into the four. Yeah, going four going from the seconds. two to three hundred down to one twenty, I, I absolutely can notice the difference. And yeah, hundred percent. So, so. <laughs> yeah, I mean. Yeah, it's one of those things. I think a lot of people these days are hopefully quite familiar with those technologies. Maybe mm -hmm. not as many people know about the sort of the frame cap, cap for latency reason sort of thing, mm -hmm. which is basically what NVIDIA Reflex does, but sort of gives you the one-click option. Um, yeah, it's a good, good way of running games. And yeah, if you don't like tearing like me, then hit those frame caps. Do you think the relevance of high-end PC hardware is narrowing to hardcore multiplayer for PC gamers? If so, how do you think NVIDIA and AMD will persuade buyers to upgrade this generation? I, he, this person gives an example of why this may be happening. So, recently upgraded to a 3080 on my HTPC connected to my TV, but it feels a side grade to my PS5 when I'm playing, say, God of War Ragnarok. I could get my numbers up with the 4080-90, but I'm not confident my experience would increase by $1,600. On the multiplayer side, you know, max frame rate on a 240Hz monitor at 1440p justifies the expensive hardware if you're a competitive esports gamer. However, my desktop PC with 1070 Ti is no problem outputting 144 FPS plus in Fortnite on my 1440p monitor. So I think it's talking about the situation where you sort of, the high performance stuff is not really giving that much of an upgrade for th over a game console. Whereas if you want to do multiplayer, a lot of hardware that's much cheaper is very capable of playing multiplayer games at high frame rates. Like you don't really need a 4090 Ti to play like Overwatch. Mm -hmm. you can, it, you're more CPU limited in terms of that. And then, you know, how is that, how are AMD and NVIDIA going to persuade buyers? I think NVIDIA, they've been trying with ray tracing. That's kind of their path to sort of convincing people that, you know, you need to spend big on these sorts of really high-end GPUs. But then even today, the 4090 often gets CPU bottlenecked 
even using the high settings in, in single player titles. So yeah. yeah, I mean, with a decent CPU at 4K, not such a problem. I don't think NVIDIA is having too much trouble convincing people to buy a 4090 <laughs> though. So no, that, that is definitely true. It's just one of those things where you've, you've got options to go about things however you like. Uh, and as time goes by with the current generation consoles, it becomes less relevant until you get a refresh or a new generation. Yeah. So, Like it certainly feels like a PS5 for $500 is significantly superior value than getting a, a $1,600 GPU. Like mm -hmm. for single player gaming, the difference is not going to be the difference in price there, mm -hmm. especially when you consider the 4090 is just the GPU and then you need to build a whole system around it. But yeah, I think for multiplayer gaming, obviously PC has always been the far superior platform for that. Um, you know, consoles don't really support the, the high frame rates and low latency that, that PCs do. But yeah, I think it, we're in this weird situation at the moment where we haven't yet really seen this next generation of games come out. Uh, a lot of things have been delayed into this year or, or future years. And I think we will see a point where these games come out that really will show off the power that PCs have right now. Because mm -hmm. really, the 4090 came out, there wasn't really the you know a new Cyberpunk or something like that to show off the capabilities. So you get a lot of these situations where things are bottlenecked. But yeah, the next generation of ray tracing games and things like that really should, should push that hardware and give people a reason to upgrade. And I expect we'll see more of that this year. Mm -hmm. Don't you think AMD is leaving a lot of performance on the table due to doing scheduling on the GPU? Shouldn't they do as NVIDIA and use all the die for graphics now that modern CPUs are so powerful? So yeah, I guess not doing on the GPU and therefore offloading it to the CPU, which does create, as you've shown in some of your latest videos once more, that for CPU limited gaming, it does have some performance implications. Yeah, are they leaving a lot of performance on the table by doing that? I don't think so. It's it's hard to say because we don't we don't have a comparison point to sort of look at and go, yeah. here's the AMD GPU that has GPU scheduling, here's the one that doesn't. Yeah, I I wouldn't have thought so. Obviously, you know, they can do a bit more with that silicon, but I don't think it would make a significant difference. But then I, I don't exactly know. And as Tim says, we don't have any hard evidence to point at. Uh, I would say, though, the main reason they do things the way they do is because it's somewhat of a console-focused architecture. That would be beneficial for the, the consoles, you know, having the GPU do all that work rather than offloading it to the CPU. Yeah. Um, especially for previous generations. Maybe not so much now, but... Well, the game consoles are only on Zen 2, so we're still talking about a fairly, by modern standards, fairly average sort of Still a big upgrade compared to previous console architectures yeah. but i know what you're saying but the cpu is going to be the cpu is not, the, it's not yeah. the world's fastest gaming cpu that's for sure uh yeah so i'd say it's probably the main reason they don't do it is because of the console angle would be my guess there uh but how much benefit it would be in terms of performance anyway it's probably not using that much die i would imagine not much gpu cycles are, are going mm. into that gpus tend to be able to do those sorts of things efficiently especially mm -hmm. if they've designed the architecture to do that mm -hmm. i think nvidia is just you know generally their idea of a gpu is that you'd be running at gpu limited as much as possible via using things like ray tracing high uh, resolutions buying high performance gpus and that sort of thing so i guess they just haven't seen the need for it because mm -hmm. their their thinking is that most people will be using a gpu limited scenario mm -hmm. so you know i guess there's pros and cons of each way of doing it maybe it's more power efficient to in terms of GPU power. It's definitely more power efficient, but, yeah. Um, but yeah, yeah, it's just multiple ways of doing things, and I guess there's there's pros and cons for each way. Mm -hmm. All right, Tim. Yep. I know you're all about aesthetics and you like how things look. How much importance do you guys put on the aesthetics of video cards? Would you ever pay more for a good-looking, it's like a Zoolander thing, a GPU? I would absolutely spend $0.00 to get a good looking GPU. Well, I I'll, couldn't I'll, care less. I'll give a slightly different answer. Did you ever think that maybe there's more to life than being really, really, really ridiculously good looking? Because, yeah, I'm a bit more forward thinking than Tim. I'm, I'm a bit more mature. I've got a few more years on Tim, a bit more experience in the, all right, I'll stop. Um, <laughs> I would, depending on how much premium the much better looking card was. So say you like you had the option between like, a real ugly duckling, like the one I... What was that 3080 I gave you? Yeah, yeah, that's pretty ugly. Yep. Yeah. Maybe we won't name names, but there are ugly graphics cards out there, and I usually give them to Tim. Um, 
But say there's, you know, an ugly card and then a really nice looking card and it's 10% more, which could be mm -hmm. a significant amount of money, I suppose. Maybe I shouldn't say $50 <laughs> more at the high end. Anywho, I would potentially invest the extra money in the good looking card because it may be easy. You might, you might be able to resell that for more. Possibly, especially Possibly. if you get a white it, GPU. And it might be easy. It might not even necessarily be that you, you uh, get enough money to justify the difference, but it's much easier to sell. Yeah, possibly. Especially if you go with a no known brand, like if you're buying an Asus ROG that, yeah, version, that's right. you're probably going to be able to get more for that on the use market mm -hmm. as opposed to like a colorful GPU. Or yeah. So ge or generally speaking, brands. we don't care about how a card looks. As, mm -hmm. It doesn't matter yeah. too much. And honestly, when I'm buying, I'm not really considering the used value of the GPU. It's not something I personally no. think about too no. much. And but if you buy like a generic, like a, a less popular brand, um, I'm not even going to yeah. name names, but you guys know there are GPU brands out there that are less popular. Um, they typically only make graphics cards and nothing else. They're certainly not an ASUS, um, for example. It, it is harder to, to, in a normal market, it is harder to resell those cards for the given asking price. Yeah, yeah, for sure. They, they lose more value. Yep. ASUS being, you know, quite a known brand. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that and Founders Edition cards actually keep their value quite well as well. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I mean, I personally, yeah, it would depend a lot on the price. I think typically the better looking cards do have kind of at times a ridiculous premium that's not worth paying for. So if it was if they if we're looking at seven hundred dollar cards yeah. and the really nice looking card was twenty dollars more, I would. That's probably like borderline for me. Yeah, I would probably just go to the twenty dollars every time. Yeah, I mean generally as well, like the better looking cards have better coolers and actually do. Yeah, but if all better. else is equal, like they run at the same temperature, same operating yeah, volume, I, everything's equal, but I, one's ugly or pretty pretty meh. Yeah, and one of them like oh that. That, I mean, that like, pretty cool. I, I could fairly easily afford a twenty dollars difference. I'm not like scrounging oh, around for coins. Or flex, something. flexing. But even then, like, I'd be seriously questioning spending an extra twenty dollars just for visuals. If it's yeah. ten dollars, I think I'd probably go with it. But I think for twenty bucks, I'd just be like sucked in. But again, it depends on the price. Here, we're talking two hundred and fifty dollars GPU. Then well, yeah, is yeah, a lot more. Than yeah. that's why. That's why I gave seven hundred as the example. Yeah, it's like seven hundred dollars versus seven hundred and twenty. Yeah, I'm I'm thinking twice. If it's like fifty dollars more, no, nah, no way. <laughs> oh yeah, no, nah, fifty dollars, no way. Yeah, that's too much. But twenty yeah. bucks, I, I'd get sucked in for twenty dollars <laughs> for sure. I'd be like, oh, I like the pretty looking one. And you know, it cost them like one dollar more <laughs> yeah. to make it, <laughs> or possibly nothing. Possibly they just nothing. had someone that had some design taste. Yeah. Anyway, we've spent probably too long on that one, so we'll move on. All right, kind of a specific question here that we normally avoid uh, answering because it only, well, it only interests some of you, but it's kind of an interesting one, uh, and Tim already has the answer anyway. So anyway, the question is, is the RTX 3070 a good GPU for 2023, or do you suggest the RX 6700 XT? So 6700 XT has 12 gigabytes of VRAM, yep. and 3070 has 8 gigabytes of VRAM, which we've sort of deemed... Yeah, pretty... So... so I covered this in my latest GPU pricing update. I actually, I think for the first time I put a cost per frame graph for used GPUs in there. Mm -hmm. So you can check it for the full information if you want. But basically we've got the 6700 XT for about 312, so about $310 US on average on mm -hmm. eBay. Mm -hmm. And for the 3070, you're looking at about $385. So okay. the 3070 does go for more these days. In terms of 4K performance using the data that we had, uh, the 40, 3070 was about 70 FPS, the 6700 XT at 65 FPS, which did mean that the 6700 XT came with a cost per frame of $4.80. I have to look very close at my phone here to see we'll these the, tiny we'll numbers. We'll put the graph up for you. And 3070 at $5.49 per frame. So the so Radeon GPU is much better value. The Radeon GPU is much better value. Again, as we were talking about earlier, we do also believe Radeon GPUs need to be cheaper because of the, the feature disparity. Then again, VRAM comes into it as well. The 6700 XT has a notable advantage there. So I think based on that data, you'd probably go for a 6700 XT at that sort of, it is better value, good VRAM. I think the pricing discrepancy is enough to, you know, deal with the, the feature difference. Mm -hmm. um, but it's not it's not massively better. It's it's sort of slightly to yeah. good levels of better. Yeah, I, there's no... There's, I wouldn't passionately argue one way or the other. If you think the 3070 is better, I'd be like, yeah, okay. 
Yeah, right. I, I totally agree. So, it's really the new market where that the gap between those products is much larger, mm -hmm. and you would definitely get a 6700 XT new because they're mm -hmm. very cheap. 3070s are still above MSRP. But yeah, on the new, on the used market, generally what we've seen between AMD and Nvidia is that that the gap closes in terms yep. of cost per frame. And so, I guess the question didn't specify yeah. used. Yeah, of course. The it assumption may be new, and if it is new, you've got your answer: <laughs> the Radeon <laughs> GPU. Yeah, definitely. But yeah, I think used GPUs, you're typically seeing at least a 20 to 30% discount, which I think is acceptable. Mm -hmm. So yeah, there's, and there's a lot of supply there as well. Maybe easier to find certain products. So yeah, okay. that's kind of where it sits. All right, Tim, hit pause there, I think. Part one done. Part two coming up. Maybe a part three. We'll see how we go. How many uh, good questions <laughs> there are. How, yeah. But yeah, anyway, we'll, we'll see. But that was fun. Good to start the series again. We've been doing this for quite a few years now, the, uh, the Q&A series every month. Yeah, good opportunity so. to catch up, chat about the latest topics. We usually do a live stream around the same time as well, which, mm -hmm. speaking of which... Well, we should get onto that soon. <laughs> <laughs> if you want access to those, probably not this one because we probably will have done it by the time this video comes out, but for future live streams, Patreon and Floatplane accounts. Links mm -hmm. in the description. If you sign up, live streams, Discord chat, which is great. BTS videos, which, let's be honest, we probably need to make a few more of those. We do, <laughs> we do. But they're there, the old ones. There are, there are. Well, there's plenty there, but we need yeah. to make more new ones. So that's that's a, a 2023 project. Yeah. And what else? Oh, there's other stuff. There's plenty of other stuff. Discord, do you mention Discord? Yeah, I think okay. I mentioned that. Tim's in Discord, hashtag monitors. Yep. A few other things as well. I just had about some games that are coming out and that's stuff. True. And ragging on all the bad releases. And <laughs> no, <laughs> so That does keep you busy. Yeah. All right, well, I think we'll uh, end it there, Tim. Who are you? Yep. No, well, you I just said, said my name. But, yeah, you spoil it. Tell, spoiler sorry, alert. I, spoilers. Spoilers, but I am, I am Tim. I'm Steve. See, See you in the next one. <laughs>